Hey, everybody, we're just going to give it another minute or two while folks filter in. So it's 12.01. Uh, we are going to kick it off. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon, this, this morning, depending on where it is you're calling in from. Uh, welcome to today's reverse pitch. We're hosting in conjunction with the Army's Small Business Innovative Research Program. I'm Morgan Hitzig. I'm an investor with Fenrock, uh, also a, a Navy Reserve officer, so fortunate to, to still be in uniform on occasion. I will be leading us through today's webinar, uh, so thank you for taking some time out of your very busy schedules to spend a couple of hours with us. Um, so I thought I'd kick off with what is today and what today isn't, uh, since we're hosting this this event. Um, most critically, today is a day to focus on specific Army CIBR funding opportunities that are currently open. So tied to real dollars that are being deployed in the next couple of months, I th think the total uh, for these three five programs is $43 million. Um, so it's a version of the Army showing money on the table for companies to compete for um, what today should not be. Uh, and we are going to send, send around a survey for your feedback um, is an infomercial for how do we do business with the Army. So today you will hear from technical teams who oversee the eventual awarded SIBRs. It's a real reverse pitch because the Army as capital provider is sharing capability challenges and is earnestly looking to technology companies to help overcome those challenges. Uh, and so what is Venerox's role in this? Uh, we are very much a convener and supporter of unique ways for the government to engage with startups. The Army wants to work with America's best and brightest tech firms, and we want to do our part to bring that message to as many founders and companies in our ecosystem as possible. So a big part of today is connecting the Army with companies that have never worked with the Army before. So whether you're building a fintech solution or cybersecurity company or multimodal AI for the physical world, uh, there is some portion of the Army, some constituency with, within the Army uh, that can for sure leverage uh, parts of your business. So I'm going to spend just one minute on Venrock, probably even less. Uh, we have a long history of building and supporting companies focused on the public interest. Uh, we are an in, in early stage venture capital firm, very much generalist. I am personally focused on, on a few key themes, um, one of which is building companies to support the national defense. So please stay in touch with us. Uh, my email is on this slide, which will end up getting sent out to all of you. Um, and it's also on our website, and we genuinely want to hear from you if you're interested in, in supporting the Army uh, and, and more broadly across defense. So we'll spend two hours today. Uh, I will walk through the agenda briefly. We're going to spend two hours together. It feels like a very long time, but I promise it's going to be well worth it. Uh, we're planning on spending about 30 minutes, uh, sort of the, the first 30 minutes on the kind of AI ML uh, focused open topic, the next one on the um, clean tech side, and then uh, the, the last one will actually cover about three open topics. So very excited uh, to have you all, all join us for the full, full programming if, if you can make it, but we're also going to run a, a tight agenda if portions of, of that are more relevant than others. Um, we are going to be hearing from seven leaders and experts across the Army. They represent $43 million worth of non-dilutive funding. These solicitations are currently in pre-release, so you will find out exactly how do I apply for one of these very specific solicitations. Um, and, and perhaps most importantly, on the Q&A side, we're really going to be focused on technical questions. So after a quick overview from Zeke on the CIBR program, uh, five to 10 minutes on, on the CIBR program, uh, we will move into um, first that kind of overview presentation and then about 15 minutes of, of live Q&A uh, that, that we can all um, talk through together. 
Uh, one thing of note, and I see a couple of other raised hands here, um, we were unable to disable the, the raised hand feature. We are not going to be calling on, on folks who, who have their hands raised, but we are going to be utilizing the, the Q&A uh, chat pane. So if you've got a question, please feel free to drop it in there. Um, again, we're going to be focusing primarily on those technical questions uh, and, and notably whether we answer your questions live. Um, or online later, every question should should end up getting getting answered by the Army Cyber team. Um, so lastly, and we can turn it over to the, the the next five open topics, Kate. If you want to go to the next slide, um, I will keep these up here. Uh, so so feel free to take a look before I I do kind of final housekeeping. Um, we've allotted thirty minutes for each one of these kind of sets of topics. Uh, the the last three are are one thirty minute block. Um, please only use the chat feature. Uh, and if you've got questions by email, um, feel free to send those to the Army team um, who will be able to respond before the open submission window closes. So um, I will close in just a minute. Uh, we would love to hear your, your feedback, probably not right now, but I will be sending a, a survey after this event. What's helpful? What information should we have added? Is there a follow-up uh, type of event you would like to see in the, the, the future. So any feedback would be much appreciated. Uh, and so with that, I will pass it over to, to Zeke, Deputy Program Manager of the Army Cyber Program. Over to you, Zeke. All right. Thank you, Morgan. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for Menrock too for this opportunity. It's a great opportunity for us. We're super excited to be here. Um, and seeing this incredible turnout too. This is great. So thank you so much for inviting us. Um, also want to thank Blaze and Dolly. You won't hear from him today, but from our team who made this connection and recognized the value in, in doing these kind of outreach events. And um, again, from how this is shaped up, we're, we're really stoked about this. So I'm excited to be here. We brought a, as you heard from Morgan, small army of presenters. We're the army, so we should do that. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to get up and take a few minutes quickly to talk about our program uh, in general and where you can find information about future opportunities as well um, before we get into the specific topics that you'll hear about. So our office, um, I, I work on the Army Small Business Innovative Research Program or SBIR, um, CIBR, if you, if you might hear me say by accident. Um, it's run out of the Department of the Army headquarters and, and our director oversees two programs. The XTech is a prize competition program and the Cyber program. These are two very important programs for the Army that are aimed at expanding the funnel of innovators to come work with us. So we have the, uh, uh, the mission of trying to bring new innovations to our soldiers um, and, and work on some of the toughest problems that we have now and that we've identified um, that we'll be facing in the future to defend our country. So the goals of these programs are to align the cutting edge technologies that are being developed on the commercial market that could be potentially game changing for the Army and align those to the priorities that uh, exist within the Army that we can you know, deliver advanced solutions to our soldiers. So XTech on the left, it's a prize program. It started in 2018 to be a very low barrier to entry way to engage the Army say it's your first time, you don't wanna go through the process of a whole contract solicitation. Um, we have a prize program that solicits topics and allows companies to submit very short white papers. The idea is to get feedback on your technologies. We bring the army experts to you. You get us the white paper, we'll collect the uh, experts that, rel that have stake in the technology that you're developing to give you feedback, direct you to the right offices, give you advice on next steps, help you pivot the technology if it needs to, to fit an army need. And in this way, you know, a rapid method to give you that feedback that could help you know where to engage with the army. Um, so that friendly front door program. And the, through that program, we're able to provide a lot of active support. So we have education programs, mentorship, networking opportunities, and exposure for your companies as they go through these competitions. Some of them have follow-on contract awards, uh, but the overall goal of those prize competitions are to really get that get your foot in the door with us, expose you to uh, the army, and expose the army to the technology you're developing, and hope you know that naturally there there can be some organic follow-on from that. 
the Small Business Innovative Research Program on the other side. That's what we're here to talk about today. This is a congressionally directed program that all federal agencies have that have a research development uh, test and evaluation budget that they have to set aside roughly 3.5% of the budget to fund innovative research, research, prototyping, testing, experimentation projects with US-based small businesses. Um, that translates for the Army to roughly about 350 to $400 million a year that we spend in this program, 43 million of which um, we're here to present today that are tied to these topics. Um, we release pro these topics, research topics from the SBR program throughout the year. So, you know, they're posted on our website as well as the De Department of Defense website. Um, and they advertise emerging opportunities that either you're, you could propose doing a proof of concept, you know, a, a small effort to show that you have the ability to solve that problem or something more mature that could go right into a prototype development. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but of note, the bottom line here is that the nature of the DOD prize authority that we use and this SBIR authorities, any firm who's won one of these competitions or been awarded an SBIR award at any level um, by any of the, any agency within the federal government can now solve, you know, have satisfied all competition requirements. So anytime in the future, anyone in the federal government can now directly contract you to do any follow on work related to that effort. So it is what I would dub the golden ticket um, that you can use to shop around to customers that you've done this work under an SBIR or you've won an X tech competition and you're eligible to now get a direct contract from that customer without further competition. Pretty nice ticket to have. Um, the next slide, with the SBR portfolio and this budget that we have, we don't we don't uh, invest in everything. You know, the gov the Army has a large budget to invest in S and T research and development for the things that we need. We've dis we've done you know extensive research to focus our SBR portfolio on these priority technology ecosystems, and they've been identified where there's strong crossover between the priorities the Army needs and what is advancing rapidly in the commercial sector. And that shows that there's going to be some good opportunities within that space for small businesses to make an impact uh, where we can draw in non-traditional and you know commercial companies to help solve some of the Army's problems, but not uh, try to solve all the problems through the SBR program. So these six in, uh, ecosystems were identified through that research. We're constantly you know checking these and, and um, you know uh, evaluating them as we go. But each one of these has specific course components within them that have been identified where we would seek research topics from our customers within the Army to promote to you all for, for technical solutions. These are some of the snippets of the core components within each of our six eco, uh, prior ecosystems, and you'll hear more details on them for the, for the topics that we're going to discuss today. The topics that we have today fall within three of our ecosystems, the AIML the clean tech and the contested logistics and sustainment. We also have three others in autonomy, immersive and wearables and sensors. Um, but of course, if any you know, high priority item that does fit within these, these constraints of the CIBR program where they're uh, applicable on the commercial and for the military market, we will of course consider them for funding. So we do have a bin of other priority funded efforts that don't necessarily fall within these portfolios. Um, next slide. The, the process, how does it work? So it, it is a little bit linear, um, but there are a lot of flexibilities within the SBR program on how you can start or exit through the program. So typically when we put out these topics, they'll be advertised as either a phase one, which means we have about $250,000 for six months awards to give out to do proof of concept studies on the topic, demonstrate that you have some feasibility to produce a prototype and solve this problem. Uh, sometimes topics will come out and they'll be direct to phase two, which means that we think that the technology and the commercial market is sufficiently mature enough to skip that step. And we can de determine the feasibility from the, the proposal and go right into the prototype development testing phase, which is a phase two. Phase two projects are typically up to $2 million, although they can go higher with, with, with you know, we can get exceptions to go higher and they go up to two years or 18 months is typically the average for doing that prototype development. We can award up to two of these phase twos for a given topic to a company. 
Um, that's that's our limit. And then there is, again, some waivers to go beyond that. But our goal through the SBR program is using that proof of concept study in phase one, two prototype development and testing efforts that can go a maximum of, say, three to uh, four years. And then we, sh at that point, we hope that we have positioned the company, the tech, and ourselves to transition that to uh, an army program, uh, to a commercial integrator of, of a prime of a, a program of record, where that might be able to integrate this component, or to some other transition where we're moving that technology out of the SBR program into the traditional army s and ecosystem. Any kind of award that follows an SBIR, we call it a SBIR phase three or a, or a transition contract. Those aren't issued by us, but those are success for our program. As I mentioned on the previous slide, those are directly awarded. They don't have to be competed, uh, but they do have to be coming from uh, actual customers outside the SBR program. So you can go through our program from a phase one to phase twos, and then we're, we're here to help you find that customer to you know, fund any follow-on work uh, as a phase three. Next slide, this isn't done alone. Um, we don't make contracts and expect you to, you know, do all the development, all the work, testing and transition on your own. We have a small army of folks to help you. We have uh, teams surrounding each of the, within each of those portfolios with the lead. They actively help manage the projects. You have a technical point of contact. They'll be assigned to the project that helps you you know, make the connections, do the research you need to do to help you with customer discovery within the Army, help solve your technical challenges, anything that they can do to help mentor, guide that project towards success. We'll have a transition partner for the project that's there to hopefully be the buyer or accept this technology when it's, when it's proven successful. And then, of course, we rely on yourselves. Oftentimes, components being developed have to be integrated into other systems, so those prime uh, contractors have to get involved. And so this, this whole family here is what it takes to be successful and to help transition these SBR efforts. And our office is here to, to help bring all this, this group together and help uh, your company be successful. Um, do I have another slide? I do. Why and what? So, you know, I, I said very little. And just, I mean, try to say a lot in a short period of time, but... There is a lot behind what we do and why we're doing it the way we've, we've set up our program. We've documented it all, made it all publicly released, uh, available to anyone to read. Um, I highly encourage this if you're interested in understanding more about our program and maybe why, we're, why we might be a little different than some of the other experiences you may have had in the past with SBIR programs. Um, we've put together an innovation framework that describes our team, our processes, the why, the what of everything we do. And this picture here on this slide is important because the why is, is these soldiers. You know, our, our goal is to make sure that our, you know, our nation is safe now and in the future. And the men and women in uniform are out there on the front lines doing that. And they are in need of the technologies that you all are developing. And they, they have great commercial applications. But as Morgan mentioned, they certainly have great applications that can help um, our our soldiers and men and women in uniform. So highly encourage reading. We have very, very short versions and full versions um, you can find at these links. I highly encourage to check that out. Um, so I know that was quick. Uh, you can definitely uh, visit our website, contact anybody on our team to learn more about the program. We post topics monthly as you know, on our website and, um, and you could follow us on social media to hear about those real time, but um, just trying to keep this moving along. I think I'll end there and kick it over to talk about our first topic to Andrew Oliveira, who's going to provide an overview of Project Lynchpin and the AIML focused open topic. And I'll be sticking around to help answer any questions at the end. So thank you very much. Andrew, over to you. It would help if I unmuted. Uh, I'm going to go through the next couple slides pretty quickly so we can get uh, more time for the Q&A. Uh, so we can advance past this one. So the AIML open topic um, is exactly that. It is a very broadly written topic uh, looking to maximize uh, the potential for interesting and innovative solutions to the myriad of Army problems. Uh, we specifically did not prescribe specific use cases 
uh, within this topic because we were looking for industry to propose use cases uh, that may fall outside of the uh, ones we currently are tracking uh, towards solutions. So intentionally very broad with the six subtopics um, focusing on synthetic data, uh, validation ver verification, uh, methodologies for mitigating risk, um, new ways of constructing LLMs to increase um, confidence in the results, um, and then collaborative technologies for uh, semi-autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous vehicles in degraded environments to continue to perform their mission. We can move off this one. And here you see the, the six uh, sub areas underneath the AI core technology components, um, data labeling, uh, predictive behaviors, computer vision, some of the very big and important ones um, highlighted here. We go to the next slide. And I've got a short uh, overview of Project Lynchpin, um, which is a program of record in PEO IWS, EMISMA. Um, here's the org chart of where we fall underneath uh, General Barker uh, in PEO IWS. Next slide. And the different PMs within PEO IWS, and we fall under PM ISNA at the top right. Next. The overview of the PEO IWS uh, structure really just kind of serves to highlight uh, there is increasing amount of, of uh, sensors and sensor data at every echelon uh, on the battle space. And Lynchpin is providing a AI ops uh, methodology and pipeline for putting capabilities into all of these platforms. Uh, next, I think. Uh, as I said, program record um, for acquiring AI for the Army. And we can keep going, so I can talk about any of those. Our vision is really the only thing I'm gonna hit on this one, um, which is that deliver trusted AI to other Army programs of record. So we're an acquisition program for acquiring AI capabilities developed in a uh, brisk, cognizant way uh, to be fielded in other uh, systems. Keep going. As part of this, uh, Project Lynchpin has engaged both government and industry partners uh, over a very wide span over the last year and a half to really build out the strategy for how we're going to implement uh, that process for leveraging industry almost exclusively to produce the components for AI solutions uh, within PEO IWS uh, programs. And I think the next slide is the last one for that we're going to cover for the linchpin overview. And what I'm going to focus on that shows how uh, the linchpin uh, pipeline is envisioned and broken out into different sub areas. And each one of these areas, one through seven, are important subtasks that are able to be contracted individually to maximize engagement, not just with industry, but with small industry, uh, such as on this call, um, from the hosting uh, service to data management and, and holdings management, um, data labeling uh, services across the many modalities of data currently focusing on computer vision um, from multiple sources, uh, including ultra high altitude and uh, horizontal boresight type imagery, uh, RF solutions uh, to support the EW and SIGA missions, um, PNT missions, um, and text, uh, generative text solutions and LLMs uh, for analysis reporting, uh, course of action, decision making uh, assistance. The model training, the verification, the deployment, all of these are envisioned as separate portions of a process that can be individually contracted uh, to maximize engagement with uh, industry and build out that pipeline of, of, uh, of a process through which uh, it, companies brought into a government managed environment and given access to government data to produce models that are by maintaining uh, progeny of that data and of the models through the process from data to label data to trained models on that data, able to manage risk in a responsible way to maximize the ability of these capabilities to be fielded into programs of record and utilized within the Army structure. Um, keep going. Next slide. And just 
kind of where our, our direction is going and all the, the work we're doing, leveraging um, some uh, partnerships with the CDAO and other Army entities. Uh, next slide. And that's our, our closer with Project Lynchpin underneath PMI tonight. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm going to hop back in here uh, to support on the, the Q&A front. Um, one thought to the, the presenters, just as, as we got through that uh, initial presentation, and, and Andrew, I'm not picking on you, uh, but because we have a lot of folks from industry who maybe don't live and breathe the Army acronyms, I think it would be be great uh, when appropriate to spell those out. So so some things that that came up on the last one, PNT, position navigation and, and, and timing. Um, hopefully, uh, if you've got any of those sort of tactical questions on what does X or Y or Z mean, feel feel free to drop it in and, and we will uh, type back a response to you. Um, so I'm going to kick it off with uh, one of the first questions that that we we received. Um, it's a little bit of a, a an overview question. How disruptive does government want us to be? Uh, and I'll give a little bit of context here, but but we are short on time. We we recently submitted to XTech and received conflicting reviews from some of those judges for an open topic on AI and ML. How innovative and disruptive does the government want the proposals to be? So I will open that up, not not just to you, Andrew, but but others who want to jump in. Okay. Well, for, from my perspective, uh, as open and as innovative as possible, uh, we went the open topic route exactly because we did not want to prescribe uh, the solution we we're looking for, or even the use case we were looking for a solution for. We're looking for um, industry to bring uh, their imagination and capabilities forward into the army problem. Awesome. Kate, um, hey, do you want to? Perfect. Uh, so now we are transitioning to the pre-submitted questions. Um, and I will read off the first one. Are there any preferred LLMs for use in generative AI solutions, both open source and or government cloud available LLMs? No, there are, there are no uh, pre-preferences on, on LLMs. Awesome. Andrew, do you want to just run down the line on these? Probably easier and, and more time efficient. Okay, I can do that. Um, uh, yeah, so for number two, yes, definitely open to cybersecurity questions as it pertains to the models or uh, things within the, the model pipeline. I'm not looking for cybersecurity solutions against like traditional uh, server uh, cloud infrastructure. Uh, number three, Um, I think that uh, demonstrating the proposal, the maturity of the, the concepts to produce a prototype uh, against a described use case uh, would really show um, how it would benefit uh, the end user for uh, going into a phase two. Andrew, I, I just received uh, feedback that some folks are just listening. So I will read off the question and then kick it over to you. So developing AI ML for the Army requires having access to ground truth data by the small business. How is this done? Um, so for phase one and phase two, uh, we're really looking for industry to uh, find data sources uh, that are able to be used for their um, proposed solution. Um, trying to procure and provide uh, data sets for this is probably going to be prohibitive for the government and then um, other future work might go towards that kind of data source. So look, really looking to leverage open source or, or generated or, or you know vendor data on, on these. Awesome. Is there a need for secure document generation, digital signature, document workflows or records management? Absolutely. Anything that uh, shifts the, the workload um, off of Army uh, from soldiers to to other users, definitely. And please describe what is of interest in retrieval augmented generation. So specifically of interest is uh, having the additional context provided uh, through RAG to say what the sources were referenced in the response to provide the operator or analyst additional context um, so that they know that they're pulling from um, appropriate data sets uh, to accept that decision. OpenAI is very broad and is able to narrow to the end state or goal. Ah, this is more of a statement. 
uh, yeah. will be extremely helpful. Um, does does the, the SAR data in the Lynchpin database have both magnitude and phase information? Uh, it, it, if we had SAR data to provide, it would, um, but that's where we're definitely looking for, again, industry to, to find a data set that's appropriate to demonstrate the technology. How do we schedule briefing with your software leaders to show them testing as a service using AI? Uh, Lynchpin has a, a industry outreach uh, coordinator and get in touch with them is, for Lynchpin specifically would be the way to do that. Awesome. How does the Army think about the security risks associated with creating more centralized databases for improved ML models? I had definitely something to think about um, and are cognizant of. I don't think that it's particularly uh, different from the traditional security risk with other databases hosting uh, Army uh, you know, sensitive information. Would you elaborate on the importance of terrain shaping obstacles or anti-mine detection technologies? Um, I mean, I, I think that, yes, they're very important. Um, as we move increasingly towards autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles, uh, the ability of those systems to function uh, without human interaction uh, to successfully complete the objective is, is definitely gonna become more important. Sounds good. Um, this is a four clarification question that we've also got a, a bunch of times in the uh, live Q&A. Um, is the call document supposed to read all submissions must not or must address uh, the following six AI subfields? I think the question yeah. is, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I got the question. Yeah, the, the, the phrasing was not optimal in the open topic. Um, all submissions must align to at least one of the six subtopics or subfields. It can align to more, but is not required to. Awesome. Uh, is there any interest in the use of AI for manufacturing of key components for improved quality control? Uh, so speaking personally as a nerd, yeah, that's super cool. Um, but I don't know if it's necessarily... Uh, I think that the Army would probably be more interested in the assessment of those components, but it, it gets into a little bit of like who's who's manufacturing and the Army tradition doesn't do the, the, the fabrication of those kinds of things, more the uh, assessment of the delivered thing. But yes, and I think that there's, there would definitely be uh, application of those within those those companies and entities that, that produce the, the widgets. Awesome. Um, as we are developing data algorithms to analyze uh, logistics data, that, that particular data is sparse. Any vision as to how to correct for this? Um, I think, again, going back to uh, either generating synthetic data sets or looking for open source sets that kind of uh, can be used to demonstrate the feasibility of the technology. Um, certainly, uh, the Army has lots of logistics data, um, but having that available is probably not realistic at this time. It, it certainly could be in the future. Um, and what multi-domain AI ML applications would you like to see, particularly from space? Uh, I mean, we're interested in, in all of the modalities, right? EOIR, uh, SAR imagery data, um, computer vision, uh, any kind of RF, and certainly any uh, methodology to uh, build models on top of models uh, for small form factor, I think, would be the most beneficial for space. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. Um, we have a, a bunch of Q&A in the uh, Q&A panel. Uh, if any folks want to jump in on the Army side on, on any specific topics, um, I will leave this open for just a minute so you can cover anything that, that speaks out to you. Um, and again, while while we are, are waiting for, for folks to jump in here, um, it's very helpful. We have 43, 44 questions in the chat. We will answer all of them, probably not today, uh, to, to, to keep it moving, um, but certainly after this event. Uh. Okay. Uh, with that, I think we could probably move to the next section. Awesome. So I will kick it over to Jason and, and pop back in uh, after his presentation to run through Q&A. Thanks.
All right, thanks, Morgan. Yeah, so I'm the Drops Branch Chief for DevCom Admix Technology Development Directorate, and I'll be going over the hybrid electric powertrain, hybrid electric power, and hybrid electric propulsion system. Uh, and I say it that way just uh, because there might be a little bit of confusion on, on the topic name. So I want to make it clear that we're really looking for hybrid electric technologies here, not uh, just hybrid electric and traditional mechanical propulsion systems. Uh, if we go to the next chart, Thank you. Yeah, so um, moving on to the topic description. Um, earlier, Zeke talked about the, the phase one and direct phase two submissions, so you understand what we're looking for for, for those phases. Um, and as discussed earlier, proposals don't need to necessarily be responsive to all of the different subfields uh, that are mentioned for this topic. They just need to be responsive to one, uh, of course, um, you know, proposals would need to describe how they're they're uh, responsive to that subfield. I uh, did want to briefly touch on each of these individual subfields to hopefully provide some clarification uh, as we receive some questions on some of them. So the first one talks about the types of vehicle systems the technology needs to be compatible with. Uh, so I want to clarify here: you don't have to be you don't have to have a technology that's compatible with all of the vehicle systems, similar to how you don't have to be responsive to all the subfields. So, um, you know, you might have a technology that's only applicable to one or two. Um, and we've left the topic open, uh, you know, for this reason. So you can you can state what what um, vehicle type your technology is applicable to. Uh, and, and similarly, we don't have any specific requirements on things like size or power here. So we're looking for companies, you know, if you have a specific vehicle type in mind, we'd recommend that the proposal include a notional configuration and design of that vehicle and, and discuss things like scalability. Uh, one thing you'll note here on, on that first subfield, we purposely are not looking for large fixed wing aircraft. Uh, the next next subfield is to optimize fuel economy and performance while considering tactical performance constraints. Uh, there is a reference here. It's for a military hybrid vehicle survey, and that can be found on DTIC. That reference is in the, the actual topic description. Uh, the next one is, is for facilitating new use cases and tactics for improved operational flexibility. Um, you know, we recognize hybrid electric vehicles that are going to provide a lot of new use cases uh, for the Army that just uh, wouldn't be possible or would be very difficult for uh, traditional mechanical type systems. Uh, so we're looking for you to discuss, discuss that. And we're not looking just for you to say, you know, your technology works at very high temperature, something like that. We want, want to know what sort of use cases or tactics the proposed technology would enable for, for the actual vehicle. Uh, next one is for technology to provide optimized balance for efficient aircraft operation throughout different flight regimes. So for here, ex for example, uh, you know, you want to provide a, a notional mission profile, how your proposed solution would be implemented across that mission profile. Uh, the next is for a system that delivers increased onboard electrical power. So electrical needs for our vehicles, it's increase substantially over the years, and we see that continuing to trend up. Uh, so how would your technology be, be able to increase onboard power and provide it to the various vehicle systems when it's needed? Uh, one thing I, I will note here, we're not, we're not looking for a new battery or battery material here, and I'll, I'll uh, again mention that on the next chart. Um, and then the last subfield is for technology to meet military operational requirements. Uh, so again, we, we recognize this topic. It's, it's open. It's open to uh, a lot of companies that you know, may traditionally work in the commercial field. So we want to make sure that you're looking at material uh, and military requirements. And again, we reference this uh, military <clears throat> hybrid vehicle survey that's on DTIC. Uh, you can see on the right hand side, these dual use applications. Uh, here we really list them. They're, they're more of general benefits that we see of the technology and benefits that would be, you know, relevant to both commercial and military applications. 
Uh, for the Army customers, uh, we've listed both aviation and ground vehicle customers. And um, so, so for this topic, it's, it's not just looking for you know, technologies that are relevant for aviation, but also for ground vehicles. And uh, you, know, you could do one or the other or both. Uh, the customers on, on the aviation side, you know, you might have uh, technology that could be, you know, directly implemented into an existing platform. So the customer there would be PEO Aviation, or you might have a technology that after the SIBR requires, you know, additional uh, S&T work. So there the customer would be uh, my organization, DEFCOM AVMIC, and similarly on the, on the um, uh, ground vehicle side. We go to the next chart. So um, Zeke touched upon these earlier, the, the clean tech uh, TBT and the different core components. Uh, there's really five core components under clean tech, but for this technology, we're just looking for technology and two of those. So it's really in, in the electric transportation and the clean industry tech. And again, uh, we're not looking for technologies like batteries that would fall under the energy storage core component. And uh, that's really going to be all for me. I'd like to hand things over to David Friedman to talk about Army Aviation's interest in this topic. Uh, David is the lead for the electrification S&T group at DEVCOM Admix Technology Development Directorate. David? Hey, good afternoon. Yeah, so my job is to give some background for what aviation uh, is interested in for this HEPS topic. So no, next slide, please. So uh, Army Aviation provides a very challenging technical problem. So we have to operate all over the world in hostile, extreme environments uh, from cold and dry to hot and wet, dirty, dusty, uh, smoky, environments with natural and man-made hazards. Uh, our systems need to be ready to go uh, when they're needed and uh, need to have high reliability. So uh, we can count on missions being accomplished and uh, passengers be protected if it's that type of aircraft. When the Army created its, this very capable airborne force, it also created a, a, a huge uh, logistics problem with getting fuel everywhere that it's needed. Uh, with each successive operation, uh, the fuel problem has grown. So, um, and it's probably gonna get worse in, in the next one. So anything that we can do to uh, reduce the fuel logistics uh, issues is, is goodness for the army. Uh, in Afghanistan, um, there was not insignificant a number of casualties for air crews uh, just delivering fuel and, and, and or water. So that fuel logistics problem is, is big. And that's one of the main reasons we're looking at uh, electrification and hybridization technologies to see if we can uh, significantly improve that. Cost and maintenance are other um, uh things we would like to improve. Next slide, please. So one way of looking at it is what kind of aircraft are we talking about? So the Army has uh, unmanned systems from small to uh, group five. Uh, the very small ones, the handhelds are battery electric already. Uh, some of the group two and group three uh, unmanned systems, a little bit larger, it could potentially benefit from hybridization. We have the manned aircraft fleet, so that's the UH-60s, uh, CH-47s, H-64s. Uh, those are you know, designed and opti optimized around their turboshaft engines and their mechanical transit missions. But there are things that could be done to uh, improve those systems. So. Um, can modernize the electrical power architecture, looking at things like reducing wire runs, using solid state um, circuit breakers, uh, smart power management, as Jason said, often on these aircraft, there's more of a power need, electrical power need than is available. 
So being able to put it where it needs to be when it needs to be there. Also, future mission systems are likely going to even draw more power. So uh, that, that's uh, something we're trying to, to look at. Another opportunity is uh, each of these aircraft have auxiliary power units that basically work on the ground, to help the aircraft uh, get started. So converting those to supplemental power units that can provide electrical power uh, throughout the flight might be an opportunity. Um, and then we have the uh, EV tall, so hybrid electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Uh, those are not currently in Army fleet, um, but we are looking closely at those. They're characterized by distributed electric power, uh, provides a lot of configuration flexibility. Uh, we are more interested in hybridization rather than battery only, just because uh, uh, the mission flexibility part of that. Um, you know, for Transition to programs of record, those first two type aircraft are, are probably the uh, nearest term opportunities. Uh, but all of these things that I'm mentioning align with our larger efforts in our science and technology roadmaps. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, we can only talk about this because there has been a lot of improvement in uh, electric uh, uh, components. Um, but if you think about electric or hybrid electric systems from the entire chain, from uh, the energy uh, storage devices to conversion to uh, power conditioning, distribution and management, all those things could use uh, improvement um, to help us get you know, this type of technology fielded. Uh, environmental hardening, uh, sur survivability hardening, um, better specific power and energy, higher efficiencies, so the thermal management problem becomes less. All of those things are uh, uh, areas of interest and in, in, in things we're looking at. So I think I used up my five minutes, so uh, I'll, I'll just close there. Connor, over to you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Connor Scrobot, and I am the program analyst for DevCom Ground Vehicle Systems Center, GVSC. Uh, I am the SIBRA and SITR coordinator over here. And while I not, might not have an engineering background, I hope to uh, be able to show you a little bit about what GVSC does and how we can help you guys out. Uh, next slide, please. So real quick, I just want to talk about what GV, GVSC is. Uh, we really are the main center for everything that's on the ground. So anything tracked or wheeled is in our main wheelhouse. We are focused on what does the Army look like for uh, 2030 and beyond. So some of our main core science and technology areas include the uh, ground vehicle robotics and autonomy, power mobility like this uh, super open topic, advanced manufacturing, survivability, and the modeling simula simulation and prototyping. So really our main focus, our next slide, please. Really our main focus is to help accelerate the delivery and sustainment of ground vehicle capabilities to our partners. Our partners being mainly the program executive office, uh, GCS, ground vehicles, ground system center and CS and CSS. PEO, CS, and CSS. And the main focus for this open topic is we're looking at how can hybrid technology powertrains be applicable to all of our ground systems. So uh, one of the questions that we received uh, commonly was what ground system are we mainly focused on? We're actually focused on all of them. So whether it be Abrams, Stryker, uh, new M10 Booker, and the next generation combat vehicle, we're looking at all areas and how hybridization can play a role in the future of these vehicles and these platforms. Some areas like that include optimizing fuel economy and performance, uh, improving operational flexibility, delivering increasing onboard electrical power, and then meet the military's operational requirements for energy efficiency, including reduced and eliminated platform thermal signature and silent watch operating capabilities. So in short, the cyber open topics really allowed us to open up 
uh, open up the floor to you guys and say what kind of new groundbreaking technologies do you have related to hybridization of any and all ground vehicles? And that is it for me and GVSC. Awesome. Thanks, Connor. Um, I can run through some of the, the pre-submitted questions in, in just a minute. There are a few bubbling up, though, that I think are worth addressing, and, and any, any folks on the Army side can, can cover them. There are a few questions around uh, phase one and direct to phase two. Can someone talk through, um, just put a, a fine point on phase one versus direct to phase two and, and how that, that plays in open topic uh, solicitations and then awards? So I don't know if you're looking, Morgan, for more of the technical side or programmatic from, from Zeke or somebody else. Um, feel, feel free to hop in on the uh, technical side, Jason. So I think for the technical side, it really depends on where your technology is at as far as a, a TRL, technology readiness level. Uh, if it's lower on the TRL scale, then it's probably more of a, you know, you would start at a phase one. If it's a little bit higher, then... We could potentially do a, a direct to phase two. Um, you know, the, the phase one, at the end of that, it's it's really a feasibility feasibility study of the technology, right? So, uh, if you think you've already demonstrated the feasibility of the technology and you're at a higher TRL, then then we could certainly entertain a direct to phase two proposal. Yeah, thanks. I've seen a lot of questions in the chat on this topic. Um, so it's a little bit topic dependent and and technology dependent, as you just explained. So some of our topics, uh, the topics themselves will state in it whether we're accepting phase one proposals, direct to phase two proposals, or both. Um, if we do a determination on the topic from a, you know, a market study, that there is solutions out there with sufficient maturity to go right into prototype testing and, and development, then we could post, we may post a topic that says this is direct to phase two only. Um, if, if it's a little bit of a mixed bag and we're looking for maybe some, you know, higher risk, higher reward solutions that may not be ready for prototyping, we may solicit topics that take both types of proposals. Um, and then we make that determination when reviewing the proposal, whether we feel it's sufficient to go direct to phase two or not. Uh, the broad agency announcement that is posted every year that all these topics are released under has a description within it that defines like what is described as direct to phase two. But essentially, every topic has to have a has a phase one write up of what they want to accomplish in that feasibility study that was just mentioned. So you have six months in a phase one to do some research and prove your concept. If you can provide essentially what would look like the final report from that phase one study, like here is our results, our proof of concept and our plan to do a prototype. That's a that's the doc, that's the documentation um, or that's looked for to, you know, approve a topic for, or a proposal for direct to phase two. So you got to see it in the topic. The topic, if it's listed as phase one only, then we can't take phase two proposals. So if it's but if the topic allows for phase two proposals to come in and you have that documentation to show that you've got some feasibility proof of concept already, then you submit that with your proposal and that's how we can approve a direct phase two. Awesome. Thanks, Zeke. Um, so I'm going to go back to some of the uh, HEP specific topics. Um, we'll do the pre-submitted questions first. We are uh, excellent on time and I, I, I know I rushed through the AIML um, Q and A live Q and A a little bit. Uh, so if we have time at the end, we will certainly come back and try to answer those. Although the the team has been uh, excellent at getting to answer some of those those questions, I think we've answered fifty six uh, of one hundred and ten questions so far in the chat. So on the pre submitted questions front, I'd like to have a better understanding of the target vehicle platforms and platforms power requirements. So over to the HEPS team. Morgan, I can take that one for the Ground Vehicle System Center. We do not have a target ground vehicle system that uh, platform that we're looking at. We're kind of looking at all areas. So whether it be, like I said, JLTV, Striker, Abrams, um, we're looking at 
any and all proposals for that. And we purposely kept the uh, power requirements open for interpretation to see what industry has to offer. So there was no set power requirements. Thanks, yeah, Tom. it's the same same answer for the aviation side. Um, and, and as I mentioned during my briefing section, you know, we're looking for industry to really give us where their technology applies and, and you know, recommend a proposal, provide a, a notional configuration and design of that vehicle that it's applicable to. Thanks, Jason. Is funding being provided for exploring new advanced winding technologies such as multi-phase and hairpin windings? Sorry. Any folks? Sorry, I think I was going to respond to that one. So, so funding is is planned to be provided uh, to select offers. No, no specific technologies been identified at this time. Uh, armies were unlikely to be in the business of wanting selected electric motors, though. So, um, you know, we're envisioning companies will probably want to partner with, uh, you know, traditional electric motor companies. And then who in the Army is interested in hybrid technology? Uh, help us understand where that signal is coming from within the Army. Yes, yeah, so I can take that one to the Ground Vehicle System Center. We're always looking for what does the Army look like uh, 2030 and beyond, right? So while hybridization and hybrid technology might not be a key role right now, it definitely can be the next 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years. So we specifically um, at the Ground Vehicle Assistance Center are looking to see what does that look like um, out on the battlefield. And as far as where the signal is coming from, uh, that's just coming from uh, Big Army and what our grand uh, grand future plans look like. Yeah, and that, that speaks to, to question num number four as well. Any Anybody uh, want to double down on the future hybrid and electric propulsion vision for the Army? I, I, I think we've talked about it a little bit. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I could take that. So, I mean, like we said, we're, we're looking for, you know, what the Army is going to look like in the next 20 to 50 years. And uh, we're seeing the, the one need for hybrid vehicles, whether it be aviation or ground vehicles, could play a role in that. Uh, so, so um, you know, that that's kind of where we're looking. Great. And for power converters, perhaps, can you please provide the desired technical objectives with rankings such as power density? I'll take this one for Ground Vehicle Systems Center. I don't think we uh, have any desired technical objectives right now, um, mainly just to keep this as a open topic to hear what industry is able to provide. Um, I know that's not a great answer for most, but we'd like to hear any and all options. Yeah, and that's, that's the same for the uh, aviation. Awesome. And then the last one from pre-submitted questions, are there specific ground vehicles that are being targeted? I, I, I think you guys already shared this, but, but worth repeating. Um, and then for power sharing and delivery, uh, is the goal TMG V2L or OBVP? Yes, I'll take that one. Uh, like I said, we're open to any and all platforms. Um, so, you know, we are currently working pretty heavily on the next generation combat vehicle and the M10 Booker are two relatively new ones, but that doesn't mean old platforms like the Striker, the Abrams, or the Joint Light Technical Vehicle um, would be discluded from this. As far as power sharing delivery, uh, I'm not familiar with those acronyms and would have to do further research on that one. So if that was your question, uh, please send an email to the Ground Vehicle System Center uh, page, which I'll share a link to later. Awesome. So I'm going to go to a couple of the uh, live uh, questions. So for the HEPs topic, which Army customer is most relevant for Group 2 UAS? Is it PEO Aviation? Yes, PEO Aviation, and then there's a, a 
PMUAS within PEO Aviation. Great, thanks, David. Uh, could you point us to any data or scenarios, perhaps open source, relevant to the fuel logistics problem? There are several uh, reports, an Army Science Board report. Um, there's the Army Operational Energy Strategy re refers to that. Uh, there's there's things out in open literature as well. Yeah, you know, we could probably provide some some references. Thanks, David. Um, and Kate, I don't know if uh, you are tracking this, but we do see on here canceled SOE check in. Uh, so if you want to close that 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 window, that would be helpful. Um, just a couple of other questions. Uh, we have. Um, we have a cyber phase one with the Air Force for a new propulsion system and are seeking a joint DOD collaborator to advance phase two. Can we send our capability statement to explore potential collaboration or can we apply for an Army open topic phase two? So I think part of this is also a, a, a process question. You know, how does having a cyber with a, a different service impact, if at all, uh, consideration with the Army? So, so I'm not sure who you want to respond to that, but I would say from Army's perspective, we, we definitely wouldn't want to be duplicating any efforts. So I think there'd need to be, you know, I'm sure we could collaborate on things, um, but if, you know, you're proposing to this, one of these specific uh, topics, you'd want to delineate what's being done under, you know, the separate effort and what's being done under your proposed effort. Yeah, thanks, Jason. I I was going to say the same, you know, just to iterate, like not to, you know, just be transparent about it. Um, collaboration is great. And we'd love to take projects that are funded from another service and take them further if there's an Army use case or work together. Um, just the duplication is the only concern. And, you know, stating in your proposal, this is the work I'm doing for the Air Force and I'm proposing this for the Army helps um, just being transparent about it. But absolutely, we we'd welcome we welcome that thank you zeke uh for HEPs, any recommended reference points to determine if a system would reduce power requirements over what is currently in place um, so i i think the, the question is is really around like how do we get a, a baseline to ensure that that we are uh, proposing an additive solution to the current solution set Could you repeat that question? Um, sure. It's the last one that, or one of the, the last ones dropped in the chat. Any recommended reference points to determine if a system would reduce power requirements over what is currently in place? So I think it's it's kind of up to the offers to, to tell us what they believe the state of the art is and explain how their technology improves upon the state of the art. Um, you know, from a, a baseline kind of perspective, um, there is a lot of open literature uh, uh, describing the UH-60 or or an aircraft very much like the UH-60. So that provides a pretty good baseline for. Uh, um, a modern, well, a, a current system and an engine. Awesome. Thank you, David. Um, one other uh, specific question here, and then I may, may pause uh, for Army folks to jump in if they have any questions that, that either they've answered in the chat or um, received previously that that they would like to answer on this particular topic. Um, do you have a topic for a graphene supercapacitor energy solution um, appropriate for the clean tech topic? My my guess is that is probably relatively specific, um, but but wanted to uh, ask it to this group. Let me see if I can read that question again.
Sorry, Morgan, can you repeat the question? Uh, sure. Um, do you have a topic for a graphene supercapacitor energy solution uh, appropriate for the clean tech topic? Um, I think, you know, we've, we've gotten a, a couple questions, Jason, on the, the clean tech side. Uh, if you have a, a, a few examples of types of, of technologies um, you have looked for in, in that domain in the past, over. So I, I think that kind of goes back to what David and Connor both briefed in their and their sections for the ground vehicle and aviation section as, as far as specifics, you know, areas that we're looking into. Um, but there's not one specific technology where we say we, we need this. Okay, sounds great. Well, I, I really appreciate it, Jason and, and team. Um, I think at this point, we will uh, move to TJ Coder who will give a programmatic overview on the Letterkenny Army Depot and his uh, three open topics. Over to you, TJ. I think so. As uh, Morgan said, I'm TJ Coder, Chief of Engineering here at Letterkenny Army Depot um, under Army Material Command. Next slide, please. Um, so with our three open topics, um, so I have these broken down to try to, to help everybody orient to them. Um, I'd say the, the first thing to do, especially with our open topic for mobile sustainment, is, is to take a look at our capabilities overview package. So this, this slide deck will be provided to everyone. You can certainly click the link, which will make it easy. But if you want to look it up now, um, do a Google search on Letter Letterkenny Army Depot. Click the capabilities. There's a drop down, I think, on the first or second drop down, and it'll take you right to the package. Um, but in general, we are focused on uh, air missile defense, but we do a lot of other things. So the more you look through this package and understand what we are trying to duplicate in the field, which is essentially everything co covered in this package, it will really help you get a grasp of all the various things that we're trying to do. So. Um, uh, as I said, focus on air missile defense, but we also do power generation, we do route clearance vehicles, small to big parts, small to big assets, wheeled prime movers, trailers, we do some tracked work, um, complex weapon systems, so anything from uh, electronic components to uh, large uh, manufacturing capabilities, what we're looking to duplicate in the field, um, and then the ability to maintain and sustain these weapon systems or soldier support assets across the board and the associated electronic components anywhere in the world uh, is a good summary of, of this topic. So we're looking for any tools uh, and it could be, be tools, facilities, hardware, software, or other types of sustainment capabilities. I don't want to just, just limit it to those things. There could be other things um, to execute our mission anywhere in the world. Uh, um, for example, you might have a manufacturing or a facility solution, um, and we'll be looking at things like mobility, modularity, snap together components, or other ways the system can both be customizable, lightweight, and modular. So as you look through the capabilities packet, um, you'll see that we have a focus on remanufacturing, but um, I, I did want to make a clarification there that we're also looking at adding manufacturing components because that's, so that's of interest to us as well. Um, so you want to consider also limitations in the number of uh, people or personnel that will be deployed. So example today, we might deploy a two-person team operating out of a Connex like container, and I'm sure there's a lot better facility solutions out there than just a Connex container, but that's the example I'm going to go with. Um, but we're looking for ways to force multiply the abilities of these folks in the field. So for example, that helps like be tech that helps these individuals with lifting things up to thousands of pounds or cobots that might help with repeatability issues out in the field. Also looking ways for ways to conduct various operations that, that might need to be done in a cleaner environment while we're operating in an austere environment. So um, environments that are gonna be prone to contamination to things like dirt and sand. So overall, we need tech that force multiplies human capability and very remote um, environments. Um, other key areas of consideration will be like low cost, low weight, easy to assemble, easy to maintain, adaptable mobile solutions or tools, and then consider uh, 
and, and I think I already said this, but I want to emphasize it, just consider that um, where we deploy, it's there's not going to be a local Burger King. So you're, you're going to be in extreme cold, extreme heat and humidity um, and dirt, mud and sand. Uh, there, there'll probably be plenty of that wherever we go. So uh, generally speaking, big maintenance and big and on big and little equipment and harsh and remote environments. Um, and then uh, one other area of consideration I wanted to add in is our ability to communicate technical information in, in things like if we're, we're working with folks in foreign languages. So that, that was something that I, I think would be in, in important to consider. Uh, next slide, please. So for the next two topics, um, are, I, I definitely think the, the capabilities packet is, is still an important component, understanding what we do overall at, at Letter Kenny, um, but also orienting you somewhat. This is a concept drawing of our modernization plan and some of the things we are implementing. Um, so when it comes to the next two topics, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, well, especially when it comes to the things like the uh, within the shop tools and enablers open topic, um, there might be something on that list there that would be, uh, you know, you, you might have improvements to or something like that. So if you have something that you're working on that maybe is already listed there, maybe there's an improvement. So I, I wouldn't say don't don't consider that because we're already looking at it. Um, but I, I did want everybody to have a general list of all the things we're looking at modernizing, but we are looking for other ways to enable the modernization of our facilities. So looking for uh, physical components, could be software. If you're doing software there, cybersecurity should be uh, considered in any of those types of sub submissions, ergonomic improvements, um, better ways of just in general, better ways of equipping our, our new facilities as they're built. Um, but not, we're not limited. I don't want to limit to these general examples I'm about to give, but, but innovative tools, tool storage and robotics. Um, and then, uh, in the capabilities packet, you can kind of see some of the stuff that we're maintaining today. Uh, but the consideration of unknown future systems should be uh, thought of as well. Um, and then for the reverse engineering topic, um, kind of the, the way we want you to, to, to look at this is, is we need to improve our reverse engineering capability across the entire process of how we do reverse engineering. And what I mean by that is, is the best way to think about this is if you look at our capabilities packet and all the things we need to do from the, the electronic components to all the mechanical components that we may need to reverse engineer because we just we, we run out of supply for a particular part or asset from so from the start to IDing the material or the and or the component um, and, and maybe it helps with IDing uh, commercially available parts to developing and automating the model to creating manufacturing drawings um, just just everything uh, that includes that in between and, and maybe other things that, that I'm not even mentioning. Um, and then the automation of the, the sourcing of parts as well. Um, I would also like to add in what I talked about with um, our mobile sustainment is, is also the ability to communicate this information to foreign entities as part of this topic. Um, so things that may have artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, things that help me look at a drawing that's done in an entirely different language and I can just see that drawing in English. Um, just imagine the communication of that tech data with foreign entities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then uh, these are our, our core components, um, but just, just wanted to, to call out some highlights there um, in relationship to our topics in the logistics system defense, the internet of things, uh, supply chain and predict predictive logistics and maintenance. Um, that's all I have. Awesome, TJ, thank you. Very much. I think we are going to uh, transition over to Nicole Allen next. Um, Nicole is going to run through uh, sort of the SIBR proposal process, um, and we are tracking very well on time. So we, we should have about uh, 25 minutes or so 
um, to close out with Q&A across all three topic areas. So we are going to go back and answer a whole bunch of those AI questions that, that we were unable to answer previously. Um, so please stick around for that. Over to you, Nicole. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Allen. I am the Army SBIR program coordinator. Um, and there's a few slides here just kind of highlighting some of the ways that um, you want to make sure that you submit both a compliant and a responsive proposal. Um, and I manage the SBIR mailbox, which we will have up shortly. You always can reach out to that email address with any administrative questions as you're working on your proposal. The technical questions are not my expertise, but all of the questions that you might have about the, um, the administrative questions, we can always help you with those. So next slide. All right, so important dates for this. The reason why this is on here is on the portal, it will say, so number one, if you have not registered for DSIP, which is that link below, please do that immediately. And when you do so, make sure that your SAM.gov registration matches your DSIP registration. You must propose as the firm that you are submitting your proposal under. So if there's a DBA name, it needs to be listed in your SAM.gov, et cetera. The other thing is, is that if you submit your proposal after 11.59 a.m., the it will close you out. So you need to ensure that um, you submit and certify your proposal completely prior to 11.59 a.m. on the day that it closes, aka noon. If you do it right at noon, it will kick you out and there's nothing we can do at that point in order to accept your proposal as it must be submitted through DSIP. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, um, these are the general ways in which um, the requirements for small businesses and how they can participate. You must be for profit. You must be US domiciled. Um, no more than 500 employees, including your affiliates. All of the R&D work must be performed in the United States. More than 50% ownership and control by individuals and legal entities that are citizens or permanent resident aliens of the United States, aka green card. Um, your principal investigator or project manager must spend more than one half of his or her employment um, in the employee of the business, precluding your full, their full-time employment with another organization. For phase one, two-thirds of the work must be performed by the small business that's proposing. And for phase two, the minimum is one half. Next slide. So there's two important policies. One is the broad agency announcement or the BAA. The BAA is the governing document for all of the defense SBIR programs. And there is then a army specific component instruction. This is now much easier to find. It is directly on the DSIP Q&A topic page. There's two links, one for the broad agency announcement and the second one for the component instructions. Make sure you are following the instructions and the component instructions as well. Those are what you will be um, ensured to, that you've followed the solicitation in order to have a responsive proposal that is checked by our team for every single proposal submitted. Although DSIP might allow you to submit something that is not, like it will give you a warning if the tech volume is over um, whatever limit we set. For phase one, that's five pages. So you will get a warning if it is coming in that way. However, DSIP would still let you submit that proposal and that is not compliant with our instructions. So you must make sure that you're following the instructions. DSIP is the tool that we use to accept proposals. Just because it is allowed to pass through there does not mean that you are still responsive to the solicitation. So please ensure that you're following the instructions as that's the most important piece. Next slide. So technical volume, we already talked about this a little bit. I wanna highlight something that has started to change a little bit. We're trying to make it a, a little bit easier for you all as you're submitting. Phase one, we require five pages. That includes everything, cover page, table of contents, glossary, five pages only. Direct to phase two has two parts in the technical volume. The first is a 10 page technical volume and a five page feasibility documentation. We've covered that before. That feasibility though needs to be based on non cyber derived work, SBIR derived work. So that is a good way in which if you have a commercialized product that you're selling to industry, that's a good feasibility documentation use in order to use in your proposal. The commercialization plan is eight slides. It must follow the template in Appendix D of the component instructions. And we now are asking that you submit that in volume five. If you accidentally submit it in volume two, it's okay. But again, follow directions. You need to have a commercialization plan. We ask for that for both phase one and direct phase twos. 
um, for all of our proposals. And it has to be in a format that we can read. So it needs to be a single PDF, including the graphics. It cannot be encrypted. It cannot be locked. We have to be able to download it. Once you submit your proposal, a good best practice is to then down your, download your proposal and make sure that you're able to view it and it's exactly how you wanted it to look. All right, and next slide. Common mistakes, too long of a technical volume, missing the commercialization plan, missing or incomplete due diligence self-disclosure form. By the time all of you submit your proposals, there is a new form that will be in volume seven. We are updating our component instructions. It will be linked on DSIP and have this updated information. There's a web form now for the due diligence self-disclosure form. This is a requirement under the Cyber Reauthorization Act of 2022. It is mandated by the broad agency announcement under the direction of Office of Secretary of Defense. We cannot accept proposals if they do not have a complete, signed, and every question filled out due diligence self-disclosure form, and it must be the correct form. This, again, should be eased with the fact that they're moving to this web fillable form that will go into volume seven of the proposal document itself. Um, but again, that is a hard requirement, and we cannot accept proposals without that document. Also, make sure that you have a SAM.gov registration. And the small business eligibility are questions that you're answering on the cover sheet, um, and you're answering those truthfully in order to be allowed to submit to that solicitation. So make sure you read those thoroughly and understand um, what you're answering on there. Next slide. All right, so this is how you can work with us. Um, two recommendations that I have in order to, I know maybe you've joined this because it was a wide open opportunity to get more information about the Army SBIR program. We do events like this a lot. The best way to learn about them is to join our email list. We email you when we have new topics going to pre-release, when we have announcements like this, when we have other large open public webinars. You can subscribe to that mailing list on armycyber.army.mil on our homepage. You also, um, can, I also recommend that you sign up for DSIP if you haven't already. They have a listserv, so all of their topics across the DOD, when those go into open submission, make sure the when they go to pre-release, you'll also get an email from DSIP then. Um, and then our email address and for both our XTech program and our SBIR program are both on here. Um, I oversee that mailbox. Uh, we always answer all of the questions in the mailbox that come in. We are more than happy to help if there's anything that we can help you with, again, around those administrative questions as you're putting together your proposals. Um, and that's all we have. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so we uh, are tracking really well on time. So we're going to turn it over again to live Q&A. Um, I have a few questions teed up, uh, hopefully across the entire board. So please keep those coming. Again, we've answered 69 of them. Uh, still have 69 open, but we will certainly uh, get to those. Um, first one for letter Kenny. For the mobile sustainment tools open topic, will open source and commercial ML models be allowed for the translation and transcribing in multiple modalities in real time? Yeah, so I'm, how I'm understanding that uh, question is when you see multiple modalities, especially like auditory, um, like physical touch and that sort of thing. Um, simple answer is yes, but the uh, any time I answer a question like this, there's always a consideration to cybersecurity and any software components or any machine learning components that we're implementing. Awesome. Um, this is a question for Connor. Uh, if there would be a hybrid component to your proposal, um, such as dense battery storage and a diesel generator input. I'm hoping, Connor, that, that this is a, a question you can certainly answer, um, such as a, a dense battery storage diesel generator input capability or battery and solar. That's a little bit confusing, uh, but but hopefully it, it, it gives you enough to answer. Yeah, actually, I just answered that one funny enough uh, through the chat, but Yes, that would qualify uh, for this open topic and look forward to hearing your proposal. Awesome. Um, another one for the, the uh, Letter Kenny team for, for you, TJ, for reverse engineering, is there interest in the manufacturing of those parts? 
Like, yes, absolutely. So again, and I was trying to explain it, um, is, is anything from the very beginning to doing identification of the simple components on the part all the way um, to the end of the, manu the manufacturing of said component. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a question that, that spans multiple programs. So anyone jump in here. If our solution crosses into multiple topics, how should we highlight this in the application? Um, Zeke, any chance you want to take that? Yes, sorry, can um, you repeat the question? Yeah, of course. If if a solution crosses into multiple topics, how do we highlight this in the application? So that's a good question. Um, is there any, I mean, I, I think I would, you know, tailor the proposal for the different topics and submit them to each topic that they apply to. Um, I don't, there's no, there's no restriction on that. And there'll be a different, you know, different group of evaluators, topic authors evaluating each of these topic proposals. So if you have a technology that can apply to more than one of these topics, uh, I would encourage you to submit to both. Awesome. Thank you. Um, on the AI front, uh, could you give examples of synthetic data? And I think we have a hot mic somewhere. Um, could you give examples of synthetic data that you wish to generate? Um, no, no specific one. Um, so any synthetic data that applies to the three main modalities uh, would be of interest. So um, synthetic imagery data, synthetic RF data, or synthetic uh, text for LLM data. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, this one is for Nicole. If a company submits for phase one, but reviewers see it more of a fit for a direct to phase two, will that lead to one, a favorable look for a phase one application or two, um, a phase one rejection or three, an ask for additional information for direct to phase two consideration? It Whatever they sim whatever the company submits the proposal for is what it's evaluated on. There cannot be additional information once the proposal is submitted. The proposal can only be submitted through DSIP and must be evaluated on the technical merits for whatever topic it was proposed under. Great. Hopefully that helps. Um, on the HEP side, what is meant by power gen for mobile sustainment tools? Anyone from the, the HEPS team want to hop in on that? David or uh, Connor? I don't know if I have an answer for that one um, specific to tools. Okay. No worries. We, we can move along. Uh, and we can also take a, a, another look at these afterwards. Um, if On the AI front, are you interested in how data manipulation cyber attack detecting ML can be applied on to onboard sensors for army vehicles. How about aircraft like the HH-60? Um, yeah, I, th I think so. I think that um, on-platform uh, cyber analysis would be applicable. Awesome. Uh, on the AI front, is there any focus on technologies which can potentially help Army recruitment? Or rather, what topic area would this potentially fall under? Uh, there's not a focus, but I think it would be a valid proposal and probably aligned to um, the, the LLM. I assume aligned to the LLM topics. Great. Um, oh boy, this is super specific. Uh, the f on the pre-solicitation, the fourth subfield <laughs> includes both LLM and RF models. Is there a reason why these modalities are included in the same subfield? Are you expecting novel LLM solutions that solve RF detection issues? Um, both were included um, because we were 
open to both uh, either, either an RF or an LM. We weren't looking for a combined. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I also want to just share with the folks who are still with us. Um, it is fabulous that we still have a couple hundred uh, people participating in, in live Q&A. Um, of note, we, we will close out live Q&A in about 20 minutes, but the rest of that of the, the time will be Q&A focused. So um, wanted to just highlight that for you in, in, in case you were waiting on um, additional programmatic areas, uh, but we will continue to answer questions for as long as we have time to do so. Uh, back to question. So on the AI front regarding data validation and verification and adversary tampering, should we interpret this as address data poisoning events so that degraded model performance can be anticipated? Yeah, I think that's a, a fair interpretation. Awesome. Uh, uh, here's another one uh, more recently. How does the army, Oh no, somebody just answered that, my, my apologies. Um, another AI question, are data set acquisition methods within scope for this open topic? Um, potentially, I know that there's uh, language in there about um, synthetic data generation. So I guess I'm not sure what data set acquisition is in this context, but yeah, potentially. Sounds good. Um, which of the subfields, if any, would ML-based weather forecasting fall into on the AI side? I would assume that would fall under uh, the LLM uh, generative solutions. Awesome. Uh, also for AI, where can we find more details about the layered defense framework? Uh, that's a good question. Um, that would be something to potentially uh, reach out to Clinchman for industry engagements on. I'm not sure where it's been published or how much can be released uh, currently about it, but um, yeah. follow up. That means good. Um, uh, this one, I believe, is for the, the HEPS group. Uh, we are proposing an air vehicle cargo carrier and a hydrogen fuel cell propulsion, would that be one or two proposals? One for the vehicle platform and one for the propulsion system? I see that being one proposal. Okay, awesome. Uh, for the letter, Kenny folks, uh, for you, TJ, can you provide additional information on areas of interest for letter Kenny around manufacturing or factory solutions? So the, I'll just reference the, the slide before um, that topic is, is uh, the areas of interest we have are listed on that slide. Um, and what we're interested in is either um, improvements to those areas or, or just literally things that we're missing, um, cutting edge technology that is, is going to help our um, sustainment operation. Sounds good. Um, another one on the AI front, although I, I think it, it probably uh, can cover all three topics. In writing the AI proposals, can we assume that it will be read by TPOCs that are domain experts uh, who are, are already familiar with standard models, uh, network methods, et cetera? Or should it be written in terms of um, uh, for a technical TPOC who is potentially not specifically an expert in AI? I would say try to target language for a, a mid-level expert, uh, somebody who's very familiar, but um, might not be uh, hands-on developing uh, models at this time. Thanks. Um, Nicole, it was said earlier that you can award up to to phase two to any given company, is that for any given topic with no limit on how many topics a company may propose? 
No, so the broad agency announcement requires one proposal per company per topic. It is at the broad agency level and it will kick it out. So if you submit more than one proposal in DSIP for the same topic, it will kick out your proposal that you previously submitted. The two phase two is the roadmap. So if you do a phase one with the army and then all of our performers for phase one, which is by, by regulation, by directive, must be invited to submit a phase two proposal. At that point, all those are again technically evaluated. And then at that point, you might be invited to submit a second phase two proposal. That's the second phase two proposal, often called a sequential. And the reasons, there's two main reasons why you might submit a second phase two proposal at that point. One is that you need more R&D funding in order to mature your technology and get it ready for transition into a program of record. And two could be because program of record dollars are not ready to move past R&D on the Army side. So those are the two reasons, and that would allow more time and more funding in order to mature the technology further. Awesome. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, is there a strong preference for models that can operate on edge devices in low compute scenarios? How should we account for the Army's compute availability for various AI deployment? There's no um, preference uh, looking for models or capabilities uh, across the, the echelons. So models that can scale or models that are targeted are both uh, of interest. Uh, and for the HEPS crew, uh, will multi-fuel engine technology be required? It's certainly not required. Um, if there is a case where um, <clears throat> multi-fuel engine will provide some some benefits, some advantages, then then it would be considered, and we'd want a, the proposal to explain to us what those advantages are. There are policies right now uh, for single fuels, so we're working the technology piece. Um, eventually, if the technology comes along and we can prove real advantages, then we'll have to work the policy piece as well. Thank you. Uh, for the uh, AI team, which sensor types wave band and wave bands are, uh, are you most interested in for synthetic data and ML analysis? And the short answer is all bands, but definitely looking at um, the bands that are traditionally used in, um, in communications, in, in SAR um, to, to start. Uh, synthetic aperture radar, sorry. Awesome. Uh, also for the AI team, uh, synthetic data generation, do we need to address all forms listed or can we target text-based synthetic generation? Um, only need to target uh, a single modality. Awesome. Um, let me just continue. We still have a whole bunch of questions. I want to see if any came in more recently. Uh, um, so I'm going to address this because I think we've we've gotten this a, a couple of times. So the recording and the slides will be sent out. They will be sent out over email. Uh, I will send a thank you with the recording tomorrow to anyone who registered, um, and then. Nicole, uh, will you also be hosting a, a copy of uh, this presentation on, on the website? The recording will be on YouTube. Awesome. Perfect. Uh, for the HEPS team, um, are you interested in renewable expeditionary power sources that can supply and or receive power uh, and or DC, DC, it basically, the, the question has a, a, a couple of um, uh, power source options in there. I would say for ground vehicles, yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, I think we will uh, probably take, uh, I'm, I may pause there. And uh, we will, uh, okay, one, one more because it's, it's easy. Is there a preferred fuel? Probably to the uh, HEPS team. 
Well, for um, Army Aviation, the fuel that all the aircraft use is jet fuel, it's JP-8. Um, but we are, you know, actively looking at other things like hydrogen or, or solid oxide fuel cells that might run off different fuels, uh, you know, tackling the, the challenges one, one at a time. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and so with that, I think we are going to close out the, the live uh, question portion of, of this afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to the Army team for showing up um, with such a uh, powerful group of, of technical folks. Um, really appreciate the participation. We had a, a ton of people join. Um, and we will be sending a post-event survey. It would be fantastic if you are willing to share your thoughts on how the Army Cyber Program can continue to reach companies that both have worked with the Army previously, uh, have worked with um, other industries previously, uh, and are maybe trying to find their way into supporting the government. So th thank you all. Um, really appreciate you joining us today, and please stay in touch.